welcome back to this uh, week 10 of inverse methods in heat transfer. In the previous video, we did forward propagation within neural networks and specifically multilayer perceptrons. In this video, we'll look at the back propagation algorithm, which is a very important algorithm historically in order to make neural networks possible on modern architectures as well as general practical problems. So here's the list of topics that I wish to cover in this video. You'll see there's a last, uh, large list of topics. So just in case I run a little bit more, uh, you know, over time compared to what I wish to, I'll split this into two videos. But as of now, the hope as I'm starting to record it is that I'll try to cover all these five topics within this video. So the first question is, why do we need a special algorithm for uh, neural networks for back propagation? What is it for? I had already told you briefly what it was for in the previous video, but I'll get into some more details uh, in this video. Then I'll split the back propagation algorithm into a few simpler cases, just so that we can understand this final most important case of back propagation for a neural network. I have found this effective in making sure that people get at least most of the important ideas behind what actually happens within a backdrop algorithm. So we we'll first do backdrop in linear cases. Effectively, we have already done this when we did gradient descent for uh, linear regression. Um, but I'll explicitly point out something called the delta rule uh, when we do this. Then we'll quickly extend this to a simple nonlinear case. Then uh, we'll look at a case where you have multiple uh, layers, but uh, each layer has only one neuron. These two cases can be thought of as just an input and output, but with multiple neurons. So these two are complementary cases. And finally, we'll put this together in a neural network. These final two topics are effectively backdrop for multilayer reciprocs. So here is the structure of a neural network. You must have seen it multiple times by now over the last few weeks. Uh, you have an input layer, a couple of hidden layers, and an output layer. And in the last video, we saw what happens when we give some input here. So suppose I give all these x's. We do some computations in these middle layers, and we finally find out the outputs. Okay. Now, the question is, um, when we do that, exactly how do we train and find out these weights w? So the algorithm, as you have seen a few times, is give some input, you give a guess for w. This neural network, you treat this as if it's a black box, goes forward, makes a prediction y hat, ground truth y, gap is j, which is just a function of y and y hat. And then you take feedback from j. And this feedback process is this. This is the gradient descent step. Uh, the k plus 1 -th iteration is the k -th iteration minus alpha times this gradient. So what we require in the feedback step explicitly is del j del w. So if I look at this figure here, it has a lot of W. So there's 5 times 7. Let's say if I ignore biases, there are 35 weights here, 49 here, and about 28 here. So around 100 weights exist within this neural network, simple neural network. So let's take a simple weight. So for example, if I take this one, in my old notation, this was W3, uh, 4, and it's the second layer. Actually, I'm going to switch notation and I'm going to use W43 second layer. So the notation we are going to use now is if this is I, or let me call this J, and the next one is I, then this is WIJ and whatever layer it is in. So this is from and the two. Okay, so we actually put where it comes from second and where it uh, comes to first. Okay, so notation is a little bit flipped. Anyway, so suppose we want del j, del w, 4, 3, 2. So let's call this something. Uh, let's call this w, 4, 3, 2 as p. So suppose we want del j, del p. What is the difficulty in solving it? Uh, why is it difficult? So why exactly do we need this backdrop algorithm? Okay, so the catch here is this. The older method or the simplest method of calculating it 
is finite difference. You might not be familiar with this name finite difference, but it's a simple idea. So the idea is this, there are about 100 weights here. Okay. So let's say there are 100, obviously there are not 100, there are more than 100 weights here. But let's say there are 100 weights here. So I think there are 102 or 112, something of that sort. Um, but uh, let's say there are 100 weights. You fix 99 of them. So suppose you want del J, del P. And there were many other weights. And J was a function of W1, W2 up till, and there is one P in the middle, and you have up till W100. Let's say so the way you do it is you perturb just this variable. So you do J, W1, W2, fix all those, do P plus delta P, fix the rest, then subtract the original J, P, W100, divided by delta P. Another way to say it is just perturb this P by a little bit. Maybe if P is 1, make it 1.00001 and see what the output is. Then this new output will be different from the old output by a little bit. Divide by delta P and as delta P goes to 0, you can estimate what del J del P is. So there is a problem though. Um, this, is, this can be accurate computationally. In fact, the algorithm we are going to uh, discuss is often checked by checking it against finite difference, but it is expensive. Now, why is it expensive? It's expensive because it requires one forward pass per weight, okay, per iteration. So remember, every iteration here requires you to calculate all del J, del W. That's what is meant by per iteration. Now, every weight will require you to perturb it once. So for example, when I wanted P, I had to perturb this P up by a little bit. Suppose I want del J, del W1, I'll have to perturb just del W1 and, uh, sorry, uh, W1 and keep the rest a constant. So basically, you require, if there are 100 weights, means 100 forward passes per iteration. So typical neural networks obviously have a whole lot more. Okay, they can have thousands, millions, and nowadays billions, and some, some, some of the recent models even have a trillion. So just to do one iteration of gradient descent, you will have to do tr trillion passes through the network and each trillion requires you to calculate the output of every neuron. Obviously, this is extremely, extremely expensive and this was the historic reason why for a lot of time, neural networks were never very big up until people found out a clever way of calculating these gradients. And in fact, we calculate in some sense exact gradients uh, on a, a computer by using chain rule. So what people found was there is an efficient way of calculating it without doing finite difference. This efficient way is what is known as backprop. And backprop has this magical property that even for 100 weights, you will still require one forward pass plus one backward pass per iteration. Okay. So if you were doing something like the network I have shown you, using backprop would be 50 times more efficient. It is not just uh, a small amount, it is 50 times, that's like 5000% more efficient. If you were taking one day with backprop to do a computation, they would have taken 50 days, a couple of months nearly. And if you take a week here, you would take an year uh, by using finite difference. So that is the computational difference between finite difference and it's just for 100 weights. Typical networks, as I will show you at least uh, one in the next week, will have a few thousand weights even for very simple cases. 
In that case, you are going to get an efficiency gain of 500 times just by using backprop. And if I come to million and billion and trillion, we can't even discuss. You know, there are things that would have taken an age of the universe for a single forward pass. So here is the catch. The catch for backprop is if you are using a gradient based method, the backprop just requires one forward pass and one backward pass, regardless of number of weights. So it's independent of number of weights, how many forward and backward passes you require. And each backward pass is effectively only roughly as expensive as a forward pass. So that's the reason for backdrop. Let's come to uh, how this is achieved by the end of the sequence that I showed you, you should be able to see at least why backdrop requires only one calculation. Okay. So for, for what I'm going to do now, um, I'm going to ignore the bias unit from now on. All the expressions that I'm writing now are written without the bias unit. Uh, you should be able to do it for the case with bias unit by yourself, but that's not really expected of you, at least as far as the exam is concerned. But for your own edification and knowledge, you can try and do that. So let's look at the general uh, neural network algorithm. The general neural net network algorithm for a network like this is very straightforward. You first initialize all these weights randomly. There are some specific uh, initialization patterns, but we initialize them all randomly. Now for each data point in the data set. So now remember you could have, uh, you know, in our inverse cases, typically we have six. I will do a case next week, which will have thousand data points for a fin. So let's say you have a um, thousand points here. And for all those X's and Y's are collect, uh, collected already. So these are the ground truths, the inputs and the outputs. And you do forward prop like we did in the last video. So you do one forward pass with this, you get a Y hat. Once you get a Y hat, you define an error. Uh, I have called this delta, but let me just skip this for now. I'll use slightly different notation. So let's say I calculate the error, which is Y minus Y hat. In fact, we will stick to a slightly different notation from the one that I have written here. We will call E as Y hat minus Y. Uh, if you see some differences between what I'm writing here and the later uh, videos or notes that I show, assume that E is either Y hat minus Y or Y minus Y hat. Just ensure that I have used sign consistently. I'll give you final expressions which will be consistent at the end of this video anyway. So now, once you have calculated this error, this is the gap between your ground truth and prediction. And then using this error, you are somehow supposed to magically calculate this value del j, del w j. Okay. So this step of calculating this is what is called a uh, backdrop. As I have written here, our expectation is if we do it right, this will be this entire process of calculating del j, del w j is only as expensive as a forward pass. Okay. So now you repeat for this new w j, you do a forward prop and keep on repeating this uh, each time for all data points take an average or you have already taken this update. So this is a stochastic gradient descent. Uh, I'll write this here the way I have written it. This is an SGD algorithm, which we saw last week. Okay. And uh, we keep on repeating all these steps for new values of W until convergence of gradient descent. What do we mean by convergence? We typically plot how J varies with number of epochs. Remember one epoch is when uh, you have seen the entire data set. Okay, so you could have, in case you have 100 data points here, in SGD you would have made 100 updates. So after 100 updates, you have seen all data points. Now suppose you plot J versus number of epochs, which I'll show you next week. Um, you will see something of this sort. It will start high then so convergence happens somewhere here where J does not change by much. So you have to derive uh, or define some uh, predefined convergence uh, limits. So the key step here, once again, is uh, just to remind you, this is just calculating del J, del W J. And let's now 
go ahead and do that in a few steps. So we'll first start with the linear case. So let me write the linear case or another way to say it is single layer multi neuron case. Okay, so you have effectively only one layer or you have zero layers, whichever way you want to define it. People define it in different ways, but you have multiple neurons. Okay, and we are also assuming here that all we have here is a linear neuron. So this is basically what we can call linear activation. Linear activation simply means that G of Z doesn't act on Z, it just returns Z as it is. So it's a linear function which just returns Z. Okay. So we use a linear activation. We will also assume a least square cost function. So we'll assume J is least squares cost function. So that lets us say something uh, very simple about how the gradients vary with respect to W. So let's see that now. What we want ultimately is this quantity, del J, del W1. So let me mark this in a different color, just so that we know that this is what we want. Um, so let me change this color. So this is the desired quantity, del J, del W1. Now, the way to do this quantity, del J, del W1, is to do an intermediate calculation. So notice this, there is an intermediate calculation here, which is del J, del W1 is not directly related to W or J is not directly related to W1. So it is related through Z. Okay. Why do I say this? So let's now look at what is actually happening. J came from the error. Why? Because J is half of Y minus Y hat square. So J is half E square. As usual, um, as I said last time, you can, if you want, think of this as minus and this as plus. It doesn't matter either way. This is E square. Okay. J, J is half E square. So the way the dependency works is this. I gave an input. Let's call this input A. It got multiplied by W1, W2, all these things, got summed up. And the moment this summing up happened, this was Z. Z then fed into, fed into Y hat. In this case, we decided Y hat is typically G of Z, but G of Z, this is linear regression is just Z. So we did nothing other than do a linear combination. Now that Y hat was not sufficient, I also fed in Y and said, okay, truth is this much, prediction is this much, find the gap, that gap is E. And from that E came J. So you see, even in this simple expression, there is a lot of chain of dependency. The chain of dependency is A1, multiplies W1 and W1 affects Z, Z affects Y hat, Y hat affects E, E affects J. Now, if we were doing finite difference, the same thing would have happened. If I perturbed W1, W1 would have perturbed Z, Z would have perturbed Y hat, Y hat would have perturbed E and E would have per perturbed J. Now, when we want del J, del W1, the question we are asking is, if I change W1 by a little bit, how much does J change? And the way to do it is to reverse this chain of causality and say, okay, J changed, not directly, but because E changed, because Y had changed and because Z changed. And as it turns out, um, as I will show you later, it is easiest to start measuring the change from Z. I mean, we will do some intermediate calculations also, but it is always useful to look at J change with the respect to W1. Well, W1 was immediately affected by Z. So how much did J change with respect to Z? So we will write it this way. Please look at this and we will repeat this expression multiple times. Del J, del W, whatever W it is, is del J, del Z, del Z, del W. Okay. But del J, del Z still hides a few uh, things in between in it. J is affected by E, del J, del E. E is affected by Y hat, del E, del Y hat, and Y hat is affected by Z, del Y hat, del Z. Then finally, del Z, del W1. Okay. Now, Z, we have already written. 
Z is W1 A1 plus W2 A2 up until W n A n. And you can see that the way Z is affected by W1 is simply through A1. Uh, nothing else affects it. Or in other words, if I do del Z del W1 here, it is simply A1. Del Z del W1 is simply A1. If you differentiate this with respect to W1, you are simply going to get A1. Okay. What about del Y hat, del Z? Well, Y hat and Z are the same because we took a linear activation. So del Y hat, del Z is just 1. What about del E, del Y hat? Notice del E, del Y hat is now going to be 1. I have put minus 1 here because I assume that minus sign. So let me just erase that. So I will just make this 1. E1 times 1. And what about del J, del E? So you can see this here. Del J, um, del J, del E is differential of half e square with respect to e, which is just e. So del j del e is e, del e del y hat is 1, del y hat del z is 1, and del z del w1 is 1. So all put together, you get del j del w1 is a1 times e. Okay. Um, I have written this here, but let's erase that. Okay. So that I was doing it for another reason. But let me not confuse you for a moment. Okay. So overall, what we notice is this. Del J, del W1 is A1E. Now, I repeat this process and do, let's say, del J, del W2. And you see that nothing changes except for it being del J, del Z multiplied by del Z, del W2. This whole number here still stays as E and this becomes A2. Okay. So you can see del z del w2 is simply a2. In general, del j del wj will follow the same rule and it will simply be aj times e. Okay, So notice this del j del wj is aj times e. Okay, This is what is called the delta rule okay? and we use this to great effect already in linear regression. So, in fact, we, we use this even while deriving the linear regression formula. So, del j del w j is a j times e. Now, let's look at the meanings of these terms. Um, so, if you look at just these neurons, the a j neuron here and the output neuron. So, the input neuron and the output neuron are connected by a single weight w j. And that WJ and the output of this neuron is E. Okay. Or the error in the output is E. Okay. So we can say that del J del WJ, at least in the linear case, seems to follow the rule that if I want del J del WJ, I need to multiply the input to the weight, which was AJ, by the error in the output, which was E. So once again, if I want this weight, I would multiply A2 by the error in the output. A okay, very simple rule. It turns out that this is true in general. Even for complex networks. Okay. If time permits, I will prove it. If not, you just take it on faith. That is, even in this network, if I want del j del w j of this, all I need to do is this input multiplied by error in this output. Now, what does error in this output mean? That I'll clarify later. But the rule in general is true. Okay, so the rule is true in general. Okay, so that finishes the delta rule for the linear case. Now, what happens in the nonlinear case? So the nonlinear case, we have a slight difference. So the difference is this. This is y hat. y hat leads to e. e leads to j. Till that everything is true. This is still z and giving g of z. g of z is what is y hat. So when I do del j del w j, I need to do 
let's write it this way del j del wj is del j del z del z del wj which is what i have written out here this whole portion is del j del wz or del j del z okay so you can see del j del e del e del y hat del y hat del z okay so the z remember is the linear output of this neuron okay del j del e is e del e del y hat is remember e is y hat minus y so sim simply del e del y hat still stays as one but what is del y hat del z last time y hat was z itself but here y hat is g of z some non-linear function typically a sigmoid uh, at least in the initial examples that we have taken as i have shown here but in other cases it might not be so del y hat del z is g prime z it simply means i have taken a derivative of g with respect to z so here is the formula now del j del w j is the old formula which was a j multiplied by e multiplied by an additional term g prime Z. So, this is an important term here that makes an appearance. So, notice when g of z is z, this simply becomes 1. So, this is the general expression for the delta rule. Okay. Now, why is it called the delta rule? Uh, I'll explain that shortly when I uh, go to the multi-layer cases. It will become a little bit clearer when we go to the uh, at final case. Okay, so, But all we have done here is taken these two cases. So now you notice input of the neuron, exit error multiplied by some nonlinear function or the derivative of the nonlinear function that took us forward. This looks like a more complex formula than it actually is, as you will see shortly. Now that we have seen a single layer, now let us take a more complex multi-layer case. I want to point out that this is something that I have made up. This is not a practical example or an example mostly that you will find in any textbook. This is just here in order for you to understand what is actually happening within a uh, neural network without some additional complications. So I am calling this a scalar chain. I am calling this a scalar chain because it is a neural network, it is a chain, but everything is a scalar. Okay, there is no vector here. The input is a scalar, this one is a scalar, there are no multiple neurons. Every single thing is a scalar here. So this is what I call a scalar chain. In that case, the forward prop becomes fairly simple to actually visualize. So the forward prop goes like this. You give x that I'm calling the input, a0 is x. Now x gets multiplied by uh, w1. So z1 is w1 a0. There is no summation. It is just a linear sum. Okay, so or it is just a linear transformation. Z1 becomes w1 a0. So we come here to the linear part. Remember, this is the linear part, this is the nonlinear part. Easier to visualize if we think of the neuron has being broken up into two parts. In fact, as I will show later, I would recommend that you zoom in and think of it this way. Two parts. The linear part, which I am going to denote by sigma, gives out z. And the nonlinear part, which we can call g, gives out a, okay, which I typically call a hat or simply a. Let me remove the hat. Um, let's just call it a, okay, or let's call it a l plus 1 for level l plus 1. If level n l went here and a weight went here, the weight got multiplied, gave z, uh, gave z, g of z gave a, okay. So that's what is happening. But useful to think of 
this hidden uh, neuron or the neuron being broken up into just like some uh, akrot or something or a fruit or something or a coconut it's just broken into two parts okay so z is w1 times a0 a1 is a1 here is g of this z okay so a1 is g of z1 immediately a1 gets multiplied by w2 so w2 times a1 is z2 here and g of z2 is a2 that's what comes out here now a2 gets multiplied by w3 gives us z3 and z3 take g of z3 and that gives us a3 and finally we say well my final output y hat is nothing but a3 once again y hat leads to e e leads to j we are assuming no bias units as i had mentioned earlier we are just simply going to assume no bias units throughout the questions we want to ask is a, a, a simple question which is what are the gradients of j with respect to the intermediate weights that is what is del j del w3 del j del w2 del j del w1 another way to ask it if i perturb w1 by a little bit how much will that affect j notice perturbing w1 affects z1 a1 z2 a2 it doesn't affect w2 w2 is just a variable it's an independent parameter z2 a2 z3 a3 y hat e and then j so we want to trace that entire process the way we are going to do it is reverse the chain of causality and that's what we are going to do okay um these if you calculate del j del w1 you can calculate delta w1 based on gradient descent etc these are the final answers that are desired now as it turns out to calculate these final answers we require some intermediate answers these intermediate answers are just like last time instead of calculating del j del w if i want del j del w1 well i will need del j del z1 because w1 did affect z1 so i need del j del z1 okay. now if i need del j del z1 z1 affects a1 so i need del j del a1 okay. now if i need del j del a1 that means i require del j del z2 because a1 affects z2 and so on and so forth z2 requires del j del a2 this requires z3 and this requires a3 so since we have so many quantities we are going to give it names whenever there is a del j del z we will call it delta okay so just like z1 z2 z3 we have delta 1 delta 2 delta 3 with the obvious meanings delta 1 is del j del z1 delta 2 is del j del z2 and delta 3 is del j del z3 similarly wherever we have a del j del a we will call it e so del j uh, del a1 is e1 del j del a2 is e2 and del j del a3 is e3 okay so you can think of our process as being when we go forward we calculate z and a when we go backward we call calculate del j del a and del j del z so i'll repeat the figure because we require a reference to the figure here let us say i am calculating del j del w1 okay so once again remember this uh, y hat leads to e and e leads to j so in a scalar chain it's very obvious to see what we are doing when i want del j del w1 I am going to follow this entire process of first calculating del j del z1 multiplied by del z1 del w1. This is after all the same trick that we applied in the delta rule. Okay, so we are going to apply the same rule or the same idea. And well, del j del z1 is nothing but delta 1. Right? Del j del z1, our notation was del j del z1 is delta 1. Of course, we have, that doesn't mean we have calculated it. We have just given it a name. Um, but what is del Z1, del W1? Notice del Z1, del W1 is Z1. How did it come from W1? W1 multiplied by A0, which is X. Uh, let's call this A0. So if A0 is multiplied by W1, it gives Z1. This means del Z1, del W1 is nothing but A0. 
So we get del j del w1 is delta 1 times a0, which looks just like the delta root. Notice input, we want del j del w, it's input to this weight, which is a0, multiplied by the error in the output, but the error in the output here is simply delta. Error in z. You can think of it as the error in z. So this portion is the immediate output of this neuron is z. And the error in that or basically is what we call del j del z. Well, we call this the error. It's not really the error, but it's something like the error. Okay, so this is exactly the delta rule, except all it is saying is multiply a0 multiplied by the delta here that will give you del j del w1. So that is the delta rule. Okay, so as I have written here, we can interpret delta 1 as the error or delta in z1. But unfortunately, we know a0. Okay, a0 is how we started the calculation. Okay, we started the calculation with easy a0, but we don't know delta 1. Now, how do we calculate delta 1? Delta 1 is del j del z1. But del j del z1 can now be thought of as one more step. When I want del j del z1, I will calculate del j del a1 and multiply by whatever connects the true 2. So here it is. Del j del z1 is this whole calculation. Del j del y hat, del y hat, del a3, etc, etc, etc. Ignore all that. Just think of this as del a1. All I am saying is del j del z1 is del j del a1 multiplied by del a1 del z1. That's a fairly non-controversial statement. Okay, So that's what is written here. Del j del z1 is del j del a1 multiplied by del a1 del z1. But what is del a1 del z1? How was a1 calculated from z1? It was simply a1 is g of z1. So del a1 del z1 is simply g prime of this. So now you notice delta 1 is del j del a1 that has a name. This is just a name. It's not a calculation. It's a name. It is E1 times G prime of Z1. So now notice del J del W1 was A0 delta 1, but delta 1 was G prime Z1 multiplied by E1. So once again, we have the question. Okay, I accept this. For calculating this, you needed delta 1. For calculating delta 1, you needed E1. But what is E1? We only have recourse to the figure again. If I want E1 here, I need del J del Z2 okay, because that's what that's the next calculation to this one. So we'll go back here. We'll say, OK, I want del J del E1 uh, or sorry, del J del A1 and del J del A1 is nothing but del J del A1 is del j del z2 because that's the next calculation multiplied by del z2 del a1. Okay. Now this calc this simply had a name. This was called delta 2. But what about z2 and a1? What's their connection? Okay, so let's go back here. This is z2 here, a1 here. And how was it created? Z2 was created by W2A1, therefore del Z2, del A1 is nothing but W2. So we write that here, del Z2, del A1 is W2. So E1 now becomes delta 2 multiplied by W2, okay. Very good. So now we have E1 uh, here which requires delta 2. What does delta 2 require? E2. What does E2 require? Delta 3. What does delta 3 require? E3. And what does E3 require? Simply del J del Y hat. So this is the entire process of backprop. So it will look strange, but let me now show it to you step by step. So the way we do it is as follows. We want del J del W1. Del J del W1 is simply this input multiplied by this output. So A0 delta 1 that I proved. Delta 1 is G prime multiplied by E1. Okay, so we calculated that 
if we want E1, the connecting link between E1 and delta 2 is W2. So E1 is delta W2 times delta 2. If I want delta 2, I want E2. Delta 2 is G prime times E2. Now you can see a, some, some kind of recursion relationship here. If I want E2, E2 is simply W3 times delta 3. And if I want delta 3, delta 3 is simply G prime times E3. Now what is E3? The final error in the output, which is simply y minus y hat or y hat minus y as we define it. Okay. So here is the full algorithm for the backprop in a scalar uh, case. So you might say, okay, wait a second. You only calculated del j del w1. What about del j del w2? Del j del w2 follows the same logic. Del j del w2 is simply going to be the input, which is a1 multiplied by the output, which is delta 2. Now, A1 was calculated during forward prop and delta 2 was calculated during back prop. So, there it is. Now, notice for each one of these weights, just like in the forward calculation for each A, the entire forward prop was done only once. The entire, this is the back prop. This is done only once. We don't do different calculations for W1, W2, W3. We Simply calculate from here delta 3, delta 2, delta 1, finish. And then after that, you can calculate del j del w2 as a1 delta 2. And similarly, del j del w3 as a2 delta 3. So let me write the full algorithm for the scalar propagation. We first do one forward pass with the current weights. So this is important. We do the forward pass with the current weights. So I have written that calculation. A0 is x. Then you multiply that, uh, get z1, a1, z2, a2, z3, a3, so on and so forth. You keep on going till the end, till you find out error. Okay. So let's say it's e3 at this point. Okay. Now you start the backdrop. How do you start the backdrop from e3 calculate delta 3, from delta 3 calculate e2, delta 2, e1, delta 1. There it is. Once you have all the deltas and the e's, then immediately, in fact, once you have all the deltas, the e's are just intermediate calculations. Once you have all the deltas, you can calculate all the del j, del w's. So the formula that comes is in the same location. Uh, remember, if you have e k coming here, you have delta k coming here. So the relationship between the two of them is simply through g prime. Okay, so delta is g prime multiplied by e k as I have drawn in this figure here. Now, if you want to go to the next step, so the output here is delta k and you want e k minus 1, we know e k minus 1 is w k delta k because the a here and the z here were related through w. So similarly, e k minus 1 is w k delta k. Then you keep on repeating this two-step dance. Just like in the forward prop, you do linear uh, g, linear g, linear g. In the reverse thing, you do g or g prime linear, g prime linear, g prime linear. It is an exact analog of what happened in the forward prop. Finally, we do the weight update uh, uh, between the two weights using the delta rule. So you have a i minus 1 and you have delta i w i connects the two and you have del j del w i is a i minus one multiplied by delta i. So this is a backprop through a scalar chain and I hope you got at least some idea of how backprop is being done. Now the next topic is to go to the actual multilayer perceptron case but since this video has been long as I said at the beginning I'll move that to the next video so I'll see you in the next video. Thank you. Mm -hmm.